case. It all began two days prior, when Monokuma gave us the additional motive. The time limit added to this killing game triggered the crime. After the announcement, some of us decided to form groups to plan our next move. I had my own plan to find the mastermind, and someone offered to help me. At the time, I never would have imagined they would become the culprit. To expose the mastermind, the culprit and I set up hidden cameras in the library. There was a hidden door in the library that showed signs of use. We deduced that the mastermind would return there to let Monokuma out. The next day, we asked Mew if she could modify some cameras for our trap. We then went to the warehouse to gather the necessary materials. All we needed were disposable cameras and a security sensor. But the culprit found something else there. The murder weapon. That's right, the shot put ball. They put the cameras, as well as the shot, in their backpack. Then, on the day the time limit would expire, the day of the murder, the culprit and I collected the modified cameras from you and visited the library. Once there, we searched the room for ideal locations to place the cameras. But even then, the culprit was preparing the murder. They began by removing the vent grate and laid it inside the air duct. Then, they moved the pile of books on top of the bookcase, pretending to organize them. After that, they placed open encyclopedias on the final bookcase. It appeared innocuous enough, but it was actually a path for the murder weapon. The culprit also tampered with the hidden camera linked to the security sensor. I was responsible for setting up the other cameras, but that one... I didn't even notice their trick. They used duct tape to keep the flash function on. After the cameras were set, the culprit and I climbed the stairs to the first floor classroom. We kept a lookout for the others and waited for the security sensor to go off. During the stakeout, we saw Kaito and six others go down to the basement. Rantaro was with them, the first victim. After watching that group into the game room, I returned to the classroom. With about one hour remaining, the security receiver I was holding went off. I assumed it was the mastermind, so I ran out of the classroom to the library. I was in such a hurry, I left the culprit behind. Looking back on it now, that was the last chance I had to stop the murder. After I had left, the culprit took the shot put ball out of their backpack and rolled it into the classroom vent. This set the murder in motion. 
Rantaro had moved the bookcase, triggering the receiver. Unbeknownst to him, the trap had been sprung. First, the modified camera took a picture of Rantaro with the flash on. Rantaro noticed the flash and approached the bookcase to inspect the camera. The camera flash lured Rantaro directly into the murder weapon's path. The shot the culprit tossed into the vent rolled through the air duct. Came out of the library's vent and kept rolling atop the bookcase. Opening the vent grate and organizing the books was all to create a path. Under normal circumstances, the victim would have been alerted by the noise. But the promotional video was masking the sound of the shot rolling. The shot kept rolling, then fell on Rantaro's head, killing him instantly. By the time we had entered the room, the murder was complete. I imagine, seeing Rantaro's body, the culprit probably thought, the mastermind is dead, the game is over, now we can all go home. But their wish didn't come true, because Rantaro wasn't the mastermind. It was murder, in an attempt to save all our lives. That is the truth. That's the truth behind your lies, Kaede Akamatsu, the ultimate pianist. The victim's body was found this morning during Himiko's underwater escape act. When we saw the piranhas in the tank, we thought that Himiko's escape failed. Of course, it was all part of the act. Himiko's escape went perfectly. But when Angie opened the curtain in front of the tank, we saw Ryoma with Piranha swarming around him. Before any of us could react, the Piranhas devoured Ryoma's body. And all that was left were his bones and the handcuffs he was wearing. That horrifying sight was the finishing touch on the culprit's own twisted magic trick. The culprit obfuscated the time and place of the murder, implicating Himiko in the process. In truth, the crime began last night, around 8.55 p.m. While preparing for the show in the gym, the culprit had a chance to be alone. It was then that the culprit used the ladder to reach the piranha tank and removed the glass lid to put inside the tank. They used it as a partition to force the piranhas to one side of the tank. Next, the culprit took the rope from the stage wing in the gym. And used the ladder once more, this time to climb up to the gym's window. Once there, they opened the window and tied one end of the rope to the window frame. 
The rope was then thrown out the window toward the pool. These preparations were key for the culprit's elaborate plan. At nighttime, past midnight, the culprit asked Ryoma to meet at his lab. All the pieces were in place. The culprit was ready to murder. First, the culprit knocked Ryoma out, probably striking him from behind. Then, they put the handcuffs from the shower room on Ryoma's wrists. shoved his head into the sink filled with water. From the water and the pain of drowning, Ryoma should have woken up and struggled. The culprit anticipated his resistance, which is why Ryoma was handcuffed. The struggle left scrapes on the cuffs and sink. But in the end, Ryoma succumbed. Ryoma was dead, but the culprit's plan had only just begun. They removed the cable from the tennis net and hung it from the window facing the pool. And then, at the pool, they connected the wire and the rope from the gym window. They returned to the lab after picking up one last thing. The rubber inner tube that was in the pool's tool shed. Once back in the lab, the culprit pulled the cable, bringing up the rope. They pulled until the rope was taut, then tied it to the lab's window frame. And thus, the gym and the lab windows were connected by a single rope. After making a hanger of sorts with another length of rope tied to the inner tube, they hung the inner tube on the rope connecting the windows. That's how the culprit created the ropeway that was used to move the body. An impressive premeditated murder, but the culprit made two crucial mistakes. The culprit got on the inner tube with Ryoma's body and slid toward the gym. With the height difference between the windows, they would have built up quite some speed. To avoid crashing through the window, the culprit used a brake. They used their own hand to grip the rope and slow down. That would have caused significant rope burn had the culprit not been wearing gloves. But due to the friction, part of a glove tore off and dropped in the pool. Regardless, the culprit reached the window and put Ryoma's body into the piranha tank. The glass pane not only kept the piranhas and the body separated, it also kept the piranhas so close together they concealed the body. After that, all the culprit had to do was untie the rope and the inner tube. 
But that's when they made their second mistake. One end of the rope came loose, and the inner tube dropped into the pool. Thus, the culprit was forced to leave two key pieces of evidence, the fabric and the inner tube. They couldn't retrieve the evidence because of the rule against swimming at nighttime. And that's the whole story. Am I wrong, Kirumi Tojo, the ultimate maid? Let's look back at the first murder. It was late last night. The culprit was in the empty room on the fourth floor. The culprit was preparing the seance murder they had planned. To use the floorboard as a seesaw, they had to cut the cross piece supporting it. The plan was to make the same preparations for all three empty rooms. This would divert suspicion away from the culprit and whoever picked a room. To cut the cross pieces, they needed a saw. I imagine they got one from the warehouse. They were planning to cut the cross pieces in all three rooms. However, when the culprit was working on the middle room, the unexpected happened. Angie walked into that room and saw the culprit making their preparations. She needed some fire for the ritual and had gone to the room for a candle. At that point, the culprit had not finished the setup and was just cutting cross pieces. Angie might not have concluded that it was tied to some kind of murder plan, but now that Angie had seen it, the culprit couldn't use the seesaw trick. Any other person might have just given up, but not our culprit. The culprit took the floorboard they loosened and struck the unsuspecting Angie in the head. The culprit did not want to give up on their plan and had to improvise. They wrapped duct tape around Angie's injury to stop the bleeding. Then they picked up her unconscious body and carried her to a research lab. While she was unconscious, the culprit hurried to tie up this loose end. But because they were in a hurry, they made a crucial oversight. They didn't notice the duct tape had peeled off and was under Angie's body. Without that evidence, we may never have figured out the culprit's trick. Carrying the supplies they needed, the culprit returned to the ultimate art lab. Locked the front door from inside. And took out the katana they brought from their own lab. They then stabbed Angie in the back of the neck, finally killing her. Then, to further confuse us, the culprit attempted to make a locked room mystery. First, they used rope from the warehouse and hung four effigies upside down. There were two reasons for this. 
to overwhelm the room with an occult atmosphere. And the other was the key to locking the room. The culprit stuck the katana into Kaede's effigy near the rear entrance. And spun the effigy around to twist up the rope. After enough turns, the culprit let go and headed for the rear door. Once released, the effigy began spinning and the gold leaf katana with it. The handle of the katana then hit the sliding lock locking the door. A difficult trick, but remember that the lock was so loose it moved at the slightest touch. The culprit also would have had the opportunity to attempt it many times. Once complete, the door was locked, but the duct tape was left behind. Perhaps the culprit noticed it, but by that point, it was too late. The room was sealed, there was no way for them to get back inside. Then, this morning, we opened up the room and discovered Angie's body. But the culprit wasn't finished. They wanted one more murder. To do that, they manipulated us into performing this seance. Of the three empty rooms, the middle one was chosen for the seance. I was invited by Kokichi to take Kibo's place in the seance. Tenko volunteered to be the medium, but she never imagined it would get her killed. To perform the seance, the culprit claimed they needed something for Tenko. A small stone that Himiko had brought from the courtyard. Tenko, at the culprit's request, bowed her head until it was touching the stone. That position was instrumental in making sure the murder went as planned. Next, Kokichi and I placed the iron cage over Tenko in the middle of the magic circle. The culprit then volunteered to drape the white cloth over the iron cage. We didn't realize it at the time, but that was a deliberate decision by the culprit. They needed to set up a murder weapon that was used to kill Tenko. While they were covering the cage with a cloth, they secretly placed the sickle. Finally, four of us placed the wooden statue on top of the cage. The culprit used the weight of the statue to keep the murder weapon in place. After the preparations were complete, we began the seance. In complete darkness, we each stood in one corner and sang the Caged Child song. When the song finished, the soul of the dead was supposed to enter the medium. But our culprit had another plan, to commit a murder in the darkness. Right after we started singing, the culprit began making their way toward Tenko. It would have been quite difficult to do in total darkness, but our culprit had a guide. 
They used the lines of the magic circle drawn with salt. The culprit felt for the salt and used it to guide them along. And when the culprit reached the center of the circle, they found the floorboard that had its cross piece cut off the night before. Then lifted up their foot and stomped down hard on the floorboard. The floorboard lifted up like a seesaw and pushed Tenko's body up toward the ceiling of the cage. Tenko was stabbed in the back of the neck by the sickle on the top of the cage. She was killed right before our eyes, and we didn't even see it. After committing the crime, the culprit followed the salt back to their corner finished the ritual, and had us light the candles. We followed the culprit's directions and removed the equipment used for the seance. And discovered Tenko's body. And while we were all focused on the body, the culprit picked up the sickle and dropped it under the floor through the hole in the corner of the room. Ironically, the final step of the murder was unwittingly carried out by us. The culprit had planned the murder so that we would unintentionally destroy some evidence. That evidence was the magic circle that the culprit used to navigate in the dark. However, the culprit didn't know that Kibo had taken a picture. He really saved us. Without that, we wouldn't know what changes were made to the circle. But now we know for certain, and we know the culprit drew the magic circle. Kureki Oshinguji, the ultimate anthropologist. You're the culprit behind these murders. The case began last night. After being convinced by Mew, we all logged in to the virtual world. To log in, you have to plug the memory and consciousness cords into the device. So, we all plug those cords into our helmets and enter the virtual world. But the culprit had accidentally plugged their cords into the wrong ports. Because of this, a connection error occurred between the culprit's brain and their avatar. As a result, the culprit would forget everything that happened in the virtual world. It's possible that this had an effect on their avatar's personality as well. Because I... I can't believe that someone so kind could commit murder. But we had no idea this error even happened. And so, we all logged in one by one. Meanwhile, Mew was the last to log in. She had modified the killing game simulator so she could accomplish a specific goal. After Mew confirmed we were all logged in, she took out the bottle of poison and placed it on Kokichi's seat. This was done to make it look like Kokichi was killed by poison when we returned. Yes, 
the reason Mew modified the simulator and brought us to the virtual world was to kill Kokichi in the virtual world, but make it look like he had died in the real world. After we had all logged in, Mew explained the world to us. Use the salon phone to log out, objects are unbreakable, your avatars use all five senses. She also explained the map of the virtual world in the mansion's entrance hall. But her explanation was intentionally false. She wanted us to misunderstand the world. However, one of us was able to see through her scheme. The very person Mew was trying to kill, Kokichi. Kokichi was going to use Mew's plan against her and plotted her murder. But Kokichi wouldn't do it himself. He used a patsy to be the culprit in this case. Kokichi was tight-lipped about the motive, so I don't know why the culprit agreed. But it seems as though, right after logging in, when Kokichi and the culprit went outside, they were already working together to execute the murder. Eventually, we met up with Kokichi and crossed the river to the chapel. Mew had us split up to try to find some secret of the outside world. Kaito, Kokichi, Gonta, Tsumugi, and I investigated the mansion, while Maki, Himiko, Kibo, and Mew investigated the chapel. Splitting us up was also part of Mew's plan. At the chapel, Mew told Maki that she was going to look around outside. She chased after our group while we were heading toward the mansion. Once she made sure we were across, she dropped the bridge into the river. This was to trick us into thinking that the river separated the mansion and chapel. At the time, we thought nothing of it. It was just another one of Mew's pranks. That's why we continued with the original plan to find the secret of the outside world. We went to the mansion and split up to look for clues. Kokichi searched the salon. Kaito searched the roof. Tsumugi searched the dining room. I searched the kitchen. And finally, the culprit searched outside the mansion. Around that time, Mew was headed for the wall that was on the side of the chapel. She passed through the wall and headed for the mansion to kill Kokichi. You see, the wall was a special wall that Mew had added herself. This wall was programmed so that only objects could pass through. And Mew had changed her avatar settings from human to object. That was the hidden route she prepared for herself. She set up a wall that only she could pass through. Mew headed toward the mansion, but she was seen by Tsumugi on the way. When she entered the mansion, she pulled out her cell phone. She didn't tell us that there was another way to log out.
Then, she spoke a name into the phone, which forced that person to log out. It was Kaito who was on the roof at the time. The same roof where Kokichi and Mew were going to meet. By having Kaito search the roof and then forcing him to log out, she was making him look the most suspicious, but her plan didn't go smoothly. Kokichi was waiting on the roof with a culprit and the toilet paper used to kill Mew. While Mew was distracted by Kokichi, the culprit snuck up from behind. And used the toilet paper from the mansion's bathroom to strangle Mew. This was only possible because objects in the virtual world are unbreakable. Mew's avatar was strangled to death, and the shock killed Mew in the real world. After the murder, Kokichi left the cleanup to the culprit and left the roof. He probably returned to the salon as soon as he could to avoid drawing suspicion. The culprit then took the lattice from the storage room and placed Mew's body on top along with the hammer and the cell phone. Culprit heaved the lattice over the railing and forcefully slid it down the roof slope. With a body on top of it, the lattice became a makeshift sled and flew off the roof. It went through the wall that only objects can pass through before crashing into the chapel. That was the crashing sound that Kibo heard in the chapel and we heard in the mansion. Mew's wall hid the fact that the mansion and chapel were actually right next to each other. That's why Tsumugi and I were able to hear the crash from the mansion. As the final step, the culprit had to then get off the roof. Because we were at the mansion, they couldn't take the stairs or they'd be seen so they used the toilet paper again to escape from the rooftop. They hung the toilet paper from the binoculars on the roof and used it like a rope to climb down. Once the culprit was safely on the ground, they pulled at the toilet paper to retrieve it. They would have returned it to the bathroom but they ran into us as we were leaving the mansion. In a panic, the culprit tossed the toilet paper somewhere nearby. Without that one little mistake, we might never have solved this case because the culprit doesn't remember. This is the truth you've forgotten, Gonta Kokuhara, the ultimate entomologist. Let's go over the trick that Kokichi and the culprit created together. Last night, Kibo saw Himiko from the window of his lab. She was carrying a black case and heading to the Exosol hangar. When she reached the hangar, she handed the case to someone through the bathroom window. That someone is the culprit of this case. Locked in the bathroom, 
the culprit had asked Himiko to bring them a certain weapon. A disassembled crossbow from Maki's lab. The culprit was going to use the crossbow to challenge Kokichi to a fight. Some time passed, and Maki made her way to the hangar. She was going to the hangar to kill Kokichi and save the culprit trapped in the bathroom. However, the hangar had an electric barrier preventing her from entering. Fortunately for her, she had an electro hammer to get around the barrier, in a way. She used her electro hammer to disable an exosol and climbed inside. She knew exosols could bypass the barrier, so she got inside one. Around that time, the culprit and Kokichi began their confrontation. While Kokichi was checking up on them, the culprit ambushed him with a crossbow. But the culprit didn't intend to kill Kokichi. They just wanted to disable him. That's why the culprit aimed for Kokichi's right arm. If they really wanted to kill him, they would have shot him in his vitals. Kokichi reeled from the arrow, and the culprit jumped on him immediately. He didn't want Kokichi to have the chance to summon an exosol with a remote. While they were fighting, something happened that caught them both off guard. The shutter of the hangar opened, and an exosol stepped inside. Kokichi was definitely not expecting an exosol to interrupt them. He pulled out his remote in an attempt to control the exosol. But Maki leaped out of the cockpit and shot Kokichi with her crossbow. The arrow hit Kokichi right in the back, and it was no normal arrow. The tip was covered in a lethal poison from my lab called Strike 9 Poison. The poison kills slowly. It seems as if Maki wanted Kokichi to confess before he died. But even with poison in his veins, Kokichi continued to spin his lies. When she had had enough, Maki tried to finish him off with another poisoned arrow. But this time, Maki was the one caught by surprise. To keep Maki from becoming the Blacken, the culprit used their body to shield Kokichi. The culprit's left arm was struck by a poison arrow. Maki remembered that there was an antidote in my lab and immediately ran off to get it. The Strike 9 poison slowly circulated through their systems and would soon kill them both. But in that desperate situation, Kokichi thought up a clever lie. He incorporated this unforeseen event into his plan to help him win the killing game. Or should I say, help him defeat Monokuma. That was Kokichi's true objective. It's why he claimed to be the mastermind. Thinking fast, Kokichi closed the shutter so that Maki could not re-enter the hangar. Thus, Kokichi's final lie was set into motion. When Maki returned with the antidote, she couldn't get back inside the hangar. So she went around to the hangar bathroom and passed the antidote through the window. But after the culprit was given the antidote, Kokichi immediately snatched it. Kokichi drank down all of the antidote while the culprit and Maki watched in horror. Maki must have been panicking, thinking the only antidote was now gone. She believed that the culprit was going to die from her own poisoned arrow. But it was all another one of Kokichi's lies. 
he had only pretended to drink the antidote. Maki tried desperately to break into the hangar, even slashing the control panel. But she couldn't get the shutter to open again. Defeated, she had no choice but to leave. After Maki had left, Kokichi took out another weapon. An electrobomb, capable of disabling communication devices for hours. Kokichi's plan was to use an electrobomb to knock out Monokuma's surveillance cameras. That was why he commissioned Mew to make the bombs in the first place. After detonating an electrobomb, Kokichi coerced the culprit into drinking the antidote. In exchange for the antidote, Kokichi asked the culprit to cooperate with his plan. Kokichi needed to work with the culprit to execute his final lie. Under normal circumstances, the culprit would never have agreed to such a plan. But because the culprit owed him for saving their life, they agreed to Kokichi's request. Ah, request is a generous term. It was more like blackmail. In any case, the two were now working together as accomplices in an insane plan. There was a lot to prepare and not a lot of time. They had to work fast. If Kokichi died from the Strike 9 poison, the whole plan would be ruined. After fabricating the scene in the bathroom, the culprit dragged Kokichi to the hydraulic press. This is how the swipe pattern bloodstain from the bathroom to the press was created. Kokichi, with the support of the culprit, stood in front of the press's control panel. The two of them were finally ready to execute the insane lie. While Kokichi was setting up the video camera near the hydraulic press's control panel, the culprit laid face up inside the press, draping their coat over their shoulders. Then, Kokichi activated the press and the camera's record button at the same time. The hydraulic press came down slowly, all caught on tape for us to see. Normally, the safety function would have triggered, but the electrobomb had disabled it. The press got lower and lower, and just as the culprit disappeared from view, Kokichi pressed the force stop button and the camera's pause button simultaneously. The two then switched places and also switched roles. The culprit and the victim. The would-be victim became our culprit and started up the press and camera. Kokichi had saved the culprit's life because his trick required their cooperation. He wanted to win the killing game, even if it meant dying himself. And so, Kokichi was crushed by the press, and the whole thing was caught on video. The culprit's left sleeve was dangling from the press, making us think he was the victim. Now alone, the culprit collected the video camera and tore the hydraulic press's power cord so that it could never be raised again. This would make it impossible for us to determine the identity of the crushed body. But there was another reason the victim was killed in this way. It obfuscated the cause of death, making the case that much more difficult to solve. This was all part of Kokichi's plan 
to create a murder not even Monokuma could figure out. With the press disabled, the culprit returned to the bathroom to flush Kokichi's clothes. Finally, they climbed inside of an exosaw to hide and waited with bated breath. And here they are now in this trial, pretending to be Kokichi. They're trying to deceive Monokuma in order to defeat the true mastermind. And that's it. That's Kokichi's unidentified culprit trick. The culprit is in that exosol. It's you, isn't it? Kaito Momota, the ultimate astronaut. With this new evidence, let's look back at Rantaro's murder. The night of the incident, Kaede and I were in the first floor classroom. We were waiting for the mastermind to trigger the trap we set in the library. Around that time, there were four people in the dining hall including the mastermind. The mastermind was probably irritated that no murders had yet occurred. After the motive was given, they knew that Kaede was planning something. But the mastermind wanted some insurance. They would take action if necessary. The mastermind excused themselves from the dining hall and went to the bathroom. And from there, to the hidden room in the library, that only the mastermind could enter. And there they waited. With less than an hour before the time limit expired, Rantaro moved the library's bookcase, which set off the receiver I was holding. It all happened the way we determined in the first trial except at the end. I ran out of the room, and Kaede rolled the shot put ball into the air vent. At the same time, Rantaro was lured by the flash of the hidden camera Kaede set. He unwittingly stepped right into the path of the shot. The shot rolled down the path Kaede made, and then... ...fell right onto Rantaro's head, killing him instantly. Or so we thought. It turns out, that was just what the Mastermind wanted us to believe. In reality, Kaede's murder plan happened quite differently. The shot put ball that Kaede rolled didn't actually hit Rantaro. He must have been surprised seeing the shot put ball drop out of nowhere like that. But his fate was sealed. The mastermind saw that Kaede's plan failed and stepped in to finish the job. The mastermind jumped out of the hidden room and attacked Rantaro from behind. And in their hand, the real murder weapon, their own shot put ball. Rantaro wasn't killed by Kaede's shot, but by the masterminds. The mastermind picked up Kaede's shot and left their shot put ball at the scene.
They also looted the Survivor Perk Monopad from Rantaro's body. Those things in hand, they retreated back into the hidden room. I remember seeing the bookcase closing just as Kaede and I got there. The mastermind had probably just finished their crime. And so, the real truth was perfectly hidden from us. We went to the class trial and reached the truth that Kaede was the culprit. But that truth had been twisted by the mastermind. After the murder, the mastermind left the stolen monopad on the table in the hidden room. And threw Kaede's shot put ball into the trash can. A little careless of them to not get rid of all the evidence. They probably believed no one would ever get into that room, but we did. Their crime complete, the mastermind went back through the hidden passageway. The passageway led from the hidden room all the way to... the girls' bathroom on the first floor. While the mastermind was pretending to use the girls' bathroom, they were actually using the hidden passageway. That's how they moved around without being noticed. Anyone could have used the hidden passageway, not just the people in the dining hall. But looking at the survivors, only you could possibly be the mastermind. If I'm wrong, please refute me. Please tell us you aren't the mastermind. Tsumugi Shirogane, the ultimate cosplayer.